Hi, I'm Dubber. I'm the director of Music Tech Fest, and this is the MTF Podcast. Now, something that was a really big deal for us at MTF Stockholm was that we not only had 50% women at the festival across the board, we also had women in the lead of all technology areas. And not just women, brilliant women. Dr. Kelly Snook joined us as our woman in the lead of the 24-hour Creative Labs, and we couldn't have picked a better person for the job. Kelly's a former NASA engineer, literally a rocket scientist, who left to become a musical instrument maker. And not just any musical instrument, the Concordia Project brings together astronomy, virtual reality and musical performance to bring to life the radical and incredible ideas of a book that celebrates its 400th birthday this year. Kelly joined Reuters journalist and MTF anchor Jamila Knowles on the interview stage to talk about Johannes Kepler, Investigative Music, Concordia, Radical Inclusion, The Music of the Spheres, Science and Art, Truth and Beauty. Kelly's an exceptional human being and a brilliant example of the intersection of ideas that you'll find at MTF, as you'll hear. Enjoy. So uh, those of you who have been around the Music Tech Fest may have seen this woman doing incredible things. I saw you last night standing on a table. And I, as you do, you were sober. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm always sober. Okay. I don't drink, so. Well, you and me both. Yeah, so when we right. stand on tables, it's yeah, entirely no, it's, our own. There's fault. a good purpose in it, yeah. <laughs> All right then. So, uh, for those of you who are not aware, this is Kelly Snook. And you have been leading the 24 hour creative labs here. That's correct, yes. All right then. So, what is that? What has been happening? Well, very early on, uh, uh, I. We had, you know, some teleconferences to plan this creative labs and from the descriptions on the website, we weren't even quite sure what was the difference between the hack lab and the creative lab. I think the different only difference is the words <laughs> in order to attract a diversity of people. So it's it's a hack it's a it's a twenty four hour hack the same way the hack lab is a hack, which is the idea that people come together and for twenty four hours they plan and build uh, and kind of demonstrate something that they've built, a musical instrument, um, a toy, uh, an idea for a future uh, instrument or piece of music technology, and they have 24 hours to do it. There's a competition, there's glorious prizes. And um, what we've done is we've combined the Hack Lab now and the Creative Labs so that we have like a very, very wide diversity of people <coughs> in the room. And we've allowed them to self-identify with different, um, different things that are their areas of expertise, from design to uh, you know, paper clips yeah, on, the, my, the audio on my shirt. People listen back. You're, you're wearing a, a, a different assortment of, of different yes. colors. Paper clips. I'm wearing some paper clips. And what these paper clips <laughs> signify is that I either have an interest or an expertise in, in certain areas. Uh, the blue one is means in design. The pink one is programming. The red one is hardware or electronics. The yellow one is something else, which I've forgotten at the moment. And the white one is ask me, could be anything. Um, so, and this is, this is because people are coming from such a wide diversity of backgrounds, we want them, and they don't know each other, and they have 24 hours to make something. So if they're trying to, to figure out who to work with, you know, this was part of our icebreaker to get people to know each other. So yeah, it's very, we have dancers and choreographers and graphic designers and, and to developers and musicians and artists and producers. So uh, it's really just really good fun. And so has that definition, as you were just outlining, changed things then? Because I've said to people before who are not necessarily in the tech community, you know, oh, you should meet these guys, they're building this app or they're doing this thing and stuff. And they say, oh, I'm not a coder. Yeah. It's too, way too scary to go to a hack anything. Exactly. I think this was just a ploy <laughs> to get people who are scared of the word hack or who think that hacking is just for coders to come and work together. So, and it worked. <laughs> and we have some amazing uh, teams of people that you otherwise wouldn't find together working on new ideas that um, programmers alone would never think of. So, um, yeah, I think we just had to get people over that initial hump of where they think they belong and to discover each other and to discover a new way of belonging. 
So, Kelly, yourself, I'm going to start delving into your world now. Oh, no. I know. Um, you know you, I mean, you've been, you've been categorised online, which I, I think is, is a bit unfair because you seem to do so many different things. But the word that comes up quite often <laughs> is rocket scientist. Yes, I do get to pull that one out of my pocket yeah. from time to time. It's kind of a legendary I put my dues in. <laughs> legendary, yeah. Um, the times when it's most useful is when I'm trying to solve a problem and I just remind myself, okay, you, you're a rocket scientist, you should be able to figure this out. It's just for basically for self-empowerment um, more than anything else. Uh, <laughs> But um, yeah, so I, I did my education, my, my PhD is in aerospace engineering, and I worked at NASA for 19 years as a civil servant in the United States doing planetary science and astrophysics and a little bit of astronomy and engineering. So yeah, I've got that. <laughs> but I always really, that was, I always felt a little bit like some pretty serious imposter syndrome because I only went into engineering in the beginning because I was too scared to do music. So it was just a way of avoiding my destiny, but it's all led back here anyway. So I wasn't able to avoid it. And now I'm just, I'm doing music, music tech. Um, and actually what I've discovered along the way is that they're very, very similar in fact. Making technology for scientists is quite similar to making technology for musicians. <laughs> scientists and musicians actually have a lot in common and uh, it, because a lot of it is about mathematics and expression of mathematics in the world in different ways. So um, yeah, as it turns out, going from a rocket scientist to a music technologist, whatever, producer, whatever you want to call me, whichever hat you want to put on, they're not actually as different as one might think. That's amazing. So um, I don't know. I've been accidentally unemployed before, but I've never accidentally been a rocket scientist. So it's quite cheap. <laughs> it was a little bit of an accident because, and it was primarily fear-driven. <laughs> so you got chased into <laughs> physics. Exactly. I was like a kind of process of elimination. All the things that sounded the scariest, I eliminated. <laughs> Music was at the top of the list of scariness. Uh, and engineering sounded, uh, you know, the least threatening. So that's what I did. And so now uh, you work with something called Concordia, is that correct? That's right. That's the name of my musical instrument that I'm building. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of a reuniting uh, of all of my interests of science and space and mathematics and harmony and music. Um, it's, a, it's a musical instrument that's being designed to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the publication of this book, which is called Epitome of Copernican Astronomy and Harmonies of the World, which was written by Johannes Kepler in 1619. And in this book, he lays out three laws of planetary motion, which he discovered by searching for musical, searching for music in the, in the solar system, so the music of the spheres. And so to celebrate this 400th anniversary, I'm creating an instrument that allows people to play the music of the spheres in virtual reality. So that's, uh, that's the Concordia project. <laughs> it's a, just a very much a uniting of science and music uh, into one instrument that becomes both a scientific instrument and a musical instrument. Okay, now what people won't be able to see on the recording back of this interview is that is an awfully well-thumbed copy. Oh yes, I've been trying to understand this book for 19 years. Yeah. So I bought it 19 years ago when I decided this was gonna be part of my destiny. I had no idea. Uh, really even how to approach it. And it's very, very difficult. To, in one of my margins, I say, here Kepler is trying to work out gravity, <laughs> which actually in this part of the book, this is the part that helped Newton discover gravity. So it's very um, like, it's kind of a historic text, but it's very dense, very difficult to read, and very difficult to understand until someone else helped me along with another book that I've also got with me as a prop. Okay. <laughs> it just describes Concordia. And so, I mean, it, the, the music of the spheres is a very romantic phrase. It is, yes. Yeah. Do you think that um, science is adequately described in these ways anymore? I mean, quite often you get... No, by no means is science described in this way Well, anymore. even just kind of trying to describe... I mean, I, I've written stuff about, um, you know, the gravitational wave discovery. Yes. Uh, and trying to make that into an analogy, I guess, without being awful about it, because I work in the media, I want, I want everyone to understand how, yes. 
how yes. disabingly exciting it was to hear this. So music. exciting. Yes. And through really sound. Good. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yes. extraordinary. So, so good. And, and, and what I was trying to, maybe what I said to people was like, you know, if you were on a lazy river in a boat and you dragged your finger through the water and you saw these waves come up. I know a lot of journalists, we were all kind of on the same thing because we were <laughs> mangling our tiny journalist minds into a world of physics that we were struggling with. Does music, does Concordia help draw those together a little more so people can feel what you're talking about? That is exa- precisely the reason for making this instrument. Uh, he, Kepler says something in this book, which is really funny, and I'm just going to paraphrase because he writes in, you know, 400 years ago language. But um, he says something like, I'm laying this out for you. God has finally revealed his, his grand order through this mathematics use your arts to express this in the world. And I've laid it out there, even if it takes 100 years for technology to catch up, basically. And it's been 400 years, and technology is just at the point where we can make this into something that you can experience viscerally, like with your ears and with your eyes and and maybe other senses as well, like feeling tactile feedback from this instrument. But that is the whole point is to take something that has been reduced to boring mathematical equations and make it, make it mind-blowing again. I, mean, I worked for a very long time at NASA, and there's something weird about the way that we present things sometimes, which, especially to other scientists, <laughs> that if, you're, if, if it's super freaking cool, then it's for the kids or it's not actual science or you know that you kind of have to make it sound dry and boring in order for it to be legitimate in a way and um so i kind of wanted to switch that up a bit and you know give people permission to experience the the incredible intrinsic harmony that we have in our in our reality one place where it's expressed just so simply is is then the movement of the planets but it's really everywhere in 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 every structure that we have in life and so eventually i'd love there to be musical instruments that you can play or that you can experience that give you insights into all sorts of different um kind of truths through beauty <laughs> these are these are both in a way these are both co- concepts that have gone out of fashion truth and beauty like truth people are even asking what is truth is there a such thing as truth does truth matter <laughs> you know this is actually a conversation that's happening in the united states <laughs> there's like you know people are claiming that it's it actually there's no truth it doesn't matter um <laughs> just, just truthiness truthiness <laughs> just uh, politics just red or blue um and then beauty also. I think beauty in art has also had a, had a, we, we've had a falling out with beauty in, in some of the fields of art. Like the more, the more random and, and ugly it sounds in a way, the more uh, cool it is or the more avant-garde it is or whatever. But I do think that our brains are wired to recognize beauty and to recognize truth. So if we create an instrument that you play that accesses both truth and beauty, that, that has a power that we're wired to respond to. So I can't, personally just can't wait to play this thing. <laughs> and so, I mean, the, the idea of uh, training to play a musical instrument, I mean, if, if anyone who's listening, anyone in the room has done this, you do hours and hours of repetition of practice, you get to know something that is usually a physical thing. Um, <coughs> and, and some days you resent it and other days, you know, and, the, and then there's the day that you panic when you have to do a <laughs> recital or a concert <laughs> or, um, you know, it's, it's a performance in the end, usually. I mean, obviously, we play for our own pleasure as well. Yes. It's nice to see something. I mean, I've seen, I've noted here that you've, you've got a term investigative music. Yes, exactly, yes. So w- what does that mean? How does that change the way we think about music? That's, oh, that's such a great question. I'm so happy you asked that. <laughs> because I think one of my motivations for building this instrument is exactly that. I feel like um, I feel like we've gone away from uh, something that's very uh, deeply important about music, which actually, if you look at the history of music, especially in the West, Western medieval Christianity defined music in a way that had nothing to do. Music didn't used to be about self-expression. It wasn't even considered an art. Music was part of the quadrivium, 
which was science, mathematics, geometry, or no, science, mathematics, geometry, astronomy, and music. And it was in that category of tools for investigating the universe. And it was because of this way of looking and using music and using musical relationships that actually was rooted in the philosophies of Pythagoras thousands of years ago, um, that, that that was the, the world that Kepler, uh, Johannes Kepler was born into, thinking of music as an investigative tool, not as just some kind of toy to play with to express ourselves, but actually something that holds the secret to life, the secret to, to everything. The, uh, what does he call it? The, uh, oh God, I wanna look it up. Um, yeah, he really thought that, that the, the whole, like his theory of everything, actually the previous speaker was saying it as well, like that waves are one of the, the one before, that everything, the theory of everything is waves, and it really is, and he knew that. And, uh, and so that, he was trying to access literally the key to understanding reality by looking at music in the solar system. And so that, I don't remember the original question, but that, <laughs> that that's fine by me. I like where you're going. <laughs> um, but you know that's super exciting for me, getting to, getting back to using music for that. Yeah. And it, you know, okay, yeah, your question was about, um, yeah, I remember now. So so <laughs> using using music as an investigative tool, investigative music is like a return to that. I think actually the future of music, at least partially, is a return to medieval definition where we use it to investigate, to convey information, and to convey information in ways that visual things and mathematics and um, written the written word can't, which is something very strangely wired in our brains that's connected directly to our emotions, it's connected directly to our memory, it's connected directly to our learning, it's connected directly to our sense of smell, uh, and if we can use music that, in a way that actually makes use of that for teaching, for learning, for understanding, then this is, you know, I think we're starting to actually get to the point where as a society we're using music what it's partially what it's for. And not just to play with, not just to make ourselves feel good, but actually, actually to, to make us understand our oneness, mm -hmm. to make us have, be conscious of who we are as human beings and how we relate to each other and how we relate to the universe. These are very, very deep human, it's a very deep human need. And I think music is part of the key to that. So, you know, Kepler, the spheres, the planets, rocket science, music, uh, <laughs> mathematics, astronomy, the arts. He, I, I don't think I've interviewed anybody who's quite so fearless about taking things that are quite often held sacred to people and separate. Mm, mm. Do you often get to work? I mean, the, the Music Tech Fest is a great place to smash all of that away. Yeah, yeah, to find your people. Yeah. Yeah, the other people that are willing to smash that away. Yeah. yeah. There, oh, I'm definitely not fearless. So. Are you not? <laughs> no, it took me until I was 42 to leave NASA. And that was a long time to be like, oh, okay, I guess I should do music. That is not, I'm completely the opposite of fearless. <laughs> I'm like, maybe, I, I maybe was doing... you chose a better time. There we go. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Or maybe I needed to actually go through that to be able to navigate my way in this new music world, which is all about technology, whereas it wasn't actually in, in originally when I was choosing what to do with my life. I don't know if I would have had the confidence to, to even take technology on if I hadn't gone through that place where I shouldn't have been in order to get to where I am. And so, although I'm, I'm pretty sure this is not going to be an easy one to answer, how would you describe, I mean, the, the answer is going to be come and play the instrument when it's ready. I know that much. But, <laughs> no, uh, come help me build it. Come and help me build my instrument. That's, that's even better. <laughs> but how, how would you describe trying to find the sound of the spheres? I mean, it could be yeah. anything in our imaginations. I mean, we talk about space as a vacuum. I'm so far out of my depth now and you're <laughs> way into this building. <laughs> hearing things. <clears throat> Sorry, hearing things in space. Not too easy. <laughs> no, that's right. And I mean, I think the first step is to get away from the idea that, 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 that things are literally generating sound and to start understanding that um, 
that mathematics and music and science and really language, they're all just trying to express things about reality, but they do it in different ways. But mathematics and music do it in very, very, very similar ways, in such similar ways that they're pretty much, they're, they are the same thing. Mm -hmm. But we don't often get to that final step of actually generating sound from the mathematics. And that's just because historically, science has been expressed visually because it could be put in print. And we didn't have the technology to, you know, to disseminate information in any other medium besides print. And so learning how to like, write things in, in language, in, in the language of mathematics, and the language of actual language, German, Latin, English, these, these were the ways that we shared knowledge and shared information, just because that's what was available to us. Now, we're just at that turning point in society where we have like exploded the number of ways that we can share our ideas with each other. And especially the technologies of sharing information through other media besides sound, besides the written word. Sound is the biggest, um, and I think most exciting and richest vocabulary that we haven't invented yet for how to codify information and how to communicate that. So how do I imagine doing that? I think it's just gonna be a lot of trial and error. So the first step that I've taken is to start to build the prototype that allows me to experiment with the mappings from the data to the sound to understand what is it that adds, adds experience and adds, my, adds to my understanding and what is it that takes away from my understanding or distracts me from what it is that, that is cool about this, this information. And the thing is, that's sometimes really easy to do if you know what you're looking for, but sometimes you don't know what you're looking for. So you, then you just have to try stuff and you have to invent a tool that allows people to experiment and, and makes it fun to experiment because it could be really annoying to experiment. You know, if it sounds just so crap that you're just like, ah, turn that off, I don't want to do that. You know, you kind of have to have a starting point. But one way that I'm approaching this is that is to make it open source and to make it modular. So anybody can create a, a, a set of mappings or a tool to experiment with a set of mappings. Anyone can create a controller. Anyone can build their own cockpit of hardware to control this instrument. Anyone can you know, design a way to, to display the information or to, so as it grows and as we learn more, we have more ways of exploring and expressing the data. And you know, that's where the fun starts. When lots of people's minds get to work on, on this problem, how do we make this fun? How do we make this exciting? Uh, so I'll shut up because I think it's our time is over. <laughs> I so I could talk to you for much longer. <laughs> Kelly, you're a really inspiring person to talk to. Oh, thank you. It's just really, really fun, and, and now I kind of want to make a musical instrument, which would be a horrible mess. But no, you I can. You can just make a Concordia module or just come okay. play it. Well, come, come play someone else's. That's probably what I'm trying. <laughs> um, but thank you very much, and thank, thank you very you. much for running the creative labs too, because I think oh yeah, it's great be fun. Really so people are hacking with the Concordia data, so that's um, that's Even a really great cool. place to start. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. Thank you very much. A big Thank round you. Of applause, please. Thanks, Ariel. Thank Dr. Kelly Snook, whose open source Concordia project has seeded and inspired further work by a team of nine MTF innovators who've taken some of these ideas in brilliant directions, folded in neuroscience, computer visualizations, Eastern traditions, and generative music in a project that's been showcased at our MTF labs at ZKM in Karlsruhe and has very much gone on to have a life of its own. And that's the MTF podcast. If you'd like to be part of MTF in any capacity to connect with this community, work with brilliant people like Kelly and join us at events like this all over the world, whatever your background or experience, go to musictechfest.net forward slash register. We'd love to have you as part of the ever-growing global MTF community, and we'll keep you posted on some really exciting events we have coming up, quite possibly near you and sooner than you might expect. Look forward to talking soon. Have a great week. Cheers.